I think one of the biggest misconceptions about addiction is that people think it's just a matter of willpower. You know, uh, that if you just try really hard, um, you can stop your addiction. And the thing is, you know, using is, is a matter of will, whether you use or not. But once you cross a line into addiction, I think that you have a disease. And it's not just a matter of uh, stopping using, which is the other actual misconception is that sobriety and recovery are the same and they're not. Sobriety means not using. So, I mean, if you have a loved one that's, you know, addicted and you want them to be sober, just kidnap them, lock them in a the closet, and 10 days later, there you go. But none of the issues are solved. Recovery is about, um, quality of life and living skills and coping mechanisms and healing and things like that. So sobriety is certainly part of that. But I think that the reason people miss the signs at all is because they're not paying attention. You know, they're just not paying attention. Because there are some pretty pretty obvious things that, you know, when you're in, in a relationship with someone that you love who's addicted, you just overlook them. So, you know, it's not like you can take a blood test and say, oh yeah, there's an addic addiction germ in there. But what you can see is that um, uh, there are changes in the person's lifestyle. You know, addiction is fatal, uh, but before it kills you, it kills relationships, it kills your job, it kills your health. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's life-threatening and lifestyle-threatening. So, <clears throat> so if you see somebody's lifestyle being affected by it and they're willing to continue using anyway, that's certainly a, a, a signal. The addicts that I work with, if, if you had a conversation with them prior to the addiction, so let's say they've had this problem for five years, if you had a conversation with them six years ago and predicted the next five years, you know, the relationships they're going to hurt, the compromises they're going to make, the way, what they're going to do to the body, uh, the dreams they're going to give up, stuff like that. If you predicted all that ahead of time, they themselves wouldn't even believe it. And when I say that to them, they, they agree. You know, there are some uh, substances where people get physically addicted, like opiates and alcohol. And actually one of the most, if not the most, dangerous withdrawal is from alcohol. Uh, opiate withdrawal might hurt more, and it might hurt so much to jump out the window, but it's not the absence of the opiate that kills you, it's jumping out the window. But with alcohol, you know, if you're addicted physically to alcohol and you stop drinking cold turkey, you could have, have a seizure, you know, I mean, all kinds of horrible things. Um, prescription drugs are, look, uh, if, you, if you're using those along with alcohol, you, you know, I mean, most of those have right on the bottle, don't drink alcohol, but most people who are addicted do that also. One of the main rationalizations for people who are addicted to prescription medication is that they got it from a doctor. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, you know, so it must be okay if a doctor prescribed it. But when you get into the um, situation where somebody's actually addicted, they're no longer taking it like the doctor prescribed. You know. They're running doctors and pharmacies or getting it on the street or things like that. So, um, but that's the biggest rationalization I hear is how can it, how can this be? A bad thing a doctor gave it to me. I, I think that the the prescription drug epidemic is uh, getting worse and worse. Um, I you know I think that uh, with how much money there is to be made and how easy it is to make it and with how um, I, I don't want to say uh, uneducated the medical profession is, where they they kind of indiscriminately. Uh, hand out um, prescription medication um, and so I think it's worse than ever. The worst thing to do if somebody that you know has an addiction is to ignore it and see the thing is though that in an addictive situation where the family or friends are involved the, the, the rule and this rule is established by the addict over and over again um, is the problem's not the problem, you're the problem for talking about the problem. And when people buy into that, then they stop confronting, and they stop you know, talking about what they're observing, and they, they uh, don't take steps to, to help or to stop helping in ways that are helpful because they feel like somehow they're in the wrong. So that's the biggest 
issue, I think. You know, a rule to remember is the problem is always the problem. Talking about the problem is not the problem. What they need to do, and this is what they get kind of in a concentrated form when we do an intervention, is that the person is, uh, their behavior is affecting others, it is affecting me, and uh, holding people accountable. I would say that uh, treat the addict uh, the same as you would treat a friend, neighbor, stranger, or enemy if they were acting this way around your family or around you. you know, families give the, their, addict, their loved one, the addict, a license to be less safe, less accountable, less responsible than they would an enemy. And family members are supposed to be more safe, more accountable, more responsible than friends, neighbors, strangers, and enemies. But the whole thing flips upside down.